We'll discuss the penultimate chapter of Chamber of Secrets on today's episode. But first, let's talk about our sponsor, Masterclass. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best artists, icons, and leaders, anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. With over 2,500 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. Since we're primarily a book podcast here, let me tell you about some incredible writing classes they have on offer. Take a class with John Legend, who will teach you songwriting. Or take a class with Roxanne Gay to learn how to write for social change. Or learn from Neil Gaiman about the art of storytelling. Or Dan Brown can teach you how to write thrillers. Speaking of creativity, I've been taking a class with National Geographic photographer Jimmy Chin. From getting the shot on location, to using natural light, to analyzing and editing photos, he teaches every part of the outdoor photography process. As someone who takes pictures outdoors in the beautiful Southwest as a hobby, this class has been a perfect way for me to advance my skills from the comfort of home. I highly recommend you check it out. It's amazing. Get unlimited access to every class. And as a MuggleCast listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash MuggleCast now. That's masterclass.com slash MuggleCast for 15% off Masterclass. Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. And this week we are discussing Chapter 17 of Chamber of Secrets, The Heir of Slytherin, a.k.a. the info dump chapter, in my opinion. It's just lots <laughs> of everything's explained. And to help us with today's discussion, we are joined by one of our friends, Tyler Starr. Hi, Tyler. Welcome back. Oh my gosh, what an honor to be back on this beautiful show and to see all of y'all's beautiful faces. Aw, we just love you, Tyler. You you really know you're Harry Potter and we've, we've known each other for a really long time. And your favorite character is actually Voldemort, as we talked about the last time you were on the show, <laughs> close to mm-hmm. two years ago, I think. Yeah. And I the timing is perfect. Eric couldn't make it this week uh, to have you on since this is a Voldemort Tom Riddle heavy chapter. So are you ready to <sighs> defend him or I don't know, explain his thinking? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, this this chapter, half Blood Prince is my favorite book for many reasons, but mostly because we get the info dump on Voldemort and Tom and how he became who he was. So this was like a little bit of an amuse bouche to that, right? That little chapter of like, oh, here is a little taste of who Voldemort used to be. So I am amped to talk about this. Awesome. Awesome. And you actually, uh, we mentioned this during our gift guide episode late last year. You recently co-authored a Harry Potter vegan cookbook. Tell us about that. Yeah, this it's always been a dream of mine to publish some kind of book that was inspired by Harry Potter. And I don't know if I just manifested it or what, if you believe in that kind of thing. But my friend Kat Miller actually came to me asking if I wanted to release a Harry Potter inspired book. And we all know how popular that unofficial Harry Potter cookbook is just the regular one. It sold so many copies. And so I thought to myself, okay, I'm kind of known as the vegan Harry Potter guy. So it's like, why not? a vegan version of that cookbook. I was like, okay, cool. That's what I'll do. And then I remembered that I don't know how to write recipes or take good photos as clearly evidenced to folks who follow me on Instagram. Uh, So I reached out to my friend, Amana, who runs the magical food department on Instagram. And she shares vegan Harry Potter inspired recipes all the time. And so uh, I reached out to her and I was like, let's do this together. I'll write some supplemental like material about why people should consider going plant-based and ditching animal products. And you write these beautiful recipes with amazing photography. But I felt like there was still one piece missing. And I was like, why? I want to see if I can get our friend Ivana Lynch to write a forward for the book because so many fans know that she's vegan. She obviously played Luna Lovegood. So who better to write a forward for a vegan Harry Potter? cookbook so, yeah look at that you know? team look at that trio <laughs> yeah and you and yeah. ivana did the uh, Her- uh chick peeps podcast which was mm-hmm. a vegan themed podcast and yeah. yeah well congratulations to you and imana and ivana i mean this is a uh awesome book everybody definitely check it out we'll have a link in the show notes as well so congratulations on that very exciting to be a published mm-hmm. author i'm sure 
oh, it's very nice. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted folks to feel even better about buying the book. So I decided that I would donate a portion of my my royalties, my author royalties to the Protego Foundation, the Harry Potter inspired animal rights nonprofit that I created and co-founded with my friend Catherine. Very cool. That's amazing. That's awesome. And you actually have some news about that, actually, that you are announcing this week. Yeah. So I've decided after nine years of working on the Protego Foundation, when I had the idea for it, to step away and turn a new page in in the organization's history. You know, when I started the Protego Foundation, it was purely out of necessity. There were still cruel photo ops with live owls tied to pedestals at Wizarding World Japan. You couldn't order butterbeer at the theme parks without the dairy-based foam topping. And the fandom just as a whole wasn't having the conversation about animal rights messages in the books or the films. But now, thanks to the Protego Foundation and amazing supporters like all of you here and uh, just the entire fandom at large, Warner Brothers has banned the use of live owls at all officially licensed Harry Potter events and attractions. You can get butterbeer without that dairy-based foam topping. And people are taking the magical creature saving lessons that are in these books and films seriously and applying them to their real world. So my friend Marissa Price is taking over. She's actually been a MuggleCast listener since she was in seventh grade. So oh. yeah, she's she's very excited. She's a very huge uh, fan. Makes us feel so old. <laughs> I know, I feel so bad. I didn't want to, I didn't know if I should say that or not, but it's like, no, no it's fine. It's I fine. mean, it sounds like she's only two years younger than me. So that sounds fine to me. We're going to be 18 years old. So we kind of just have to suck it up. At this point, <laughs> oh, we'll have to have her on the show sometime. But go on, Tyler. So I've I've accomplished everything that I've wanted with the organization, and uh, I'm really proud. And I'm sure we've all left projects before, right? There's a yeah. bittersweet mm-hmm. feeling, but yeah, 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 I'm excited. Cool. Well, congratulations on the run, on the nine year run. That's amazing, and it's great to hear that the Protego Foundation will continue on. Yeah. And I know you've got some other plans in the Wizarding World as well. So we'll mm-hmm. be excited to hear about those in due course. Yeah. But uh, yeah, congrats. Andrew, I, I th- wanted to Thank say you. too, I think Tyler has probably in some way subconsciously influenced us because some of our discussions in these chapter by chapter episodes have brought up animal cruelty. We've talked about Hedwig. We talked mm-hmm. about Fang on the last episode, nobody letting him out to do his business, right? I mean- mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we continue the fight. Let Fang P. Let yeah. Fang P. <laughs> I love that. No, well, Thank I'm, you all for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're right, Micah. And the Protego Foundation is amazing. So job well done, Tyler. And like I said, excited to see that it is going to continue. And I'm sure you'll continue to uh, be an avid supporter of everything that they do and and Mm -hmm. continue to champion them. So before we get to Chapter 17 today, we wanted to offer a quick reaction to Hogwarts Legacy. It was released for PlayStation 5, Xbox Series S and X and PC this past week. Micah and I have played it. A little bit so far. I'm about five or six hours into it. I think I'm about 4% through the game, which probably equals out to about where you're at. I I just explored Hogsmeade. I'm not sure if that equates to where you are. Yeah, you're probably about four-ish hours, I guess I would say. I mean, you could take your time roaming the castle. It's like... it's it. We're all going to be on different paths, I think. But we are going to do a full review of the game on episode 600. We wanted to give us some time to play the game because it takes a while to get to get through it. Um, And I doubt we'll have it finished by episode 600, but we just want to spend more time with it. (laughs) Yeah, no chance. (laughs) Um, But just to offer quick reviews now, since the game has been released and we played it for a few hours, the game is beautiful. I am really impressed by how big the world is. It is still stunning me five hours in that I can actually explore Hogwarts And the castle really feels alive. There's magic everywhere. The students are talking about Ilvermorny and, you know, spells. And you walk around the castle at night and it's quiet. And during the day, it's populated with students doing magic. And you see the ghosts and and peeves. And uh, you go outside and you see owls. Or even inside, you see owls flying around. It's really, really cool. I'm not experiencing many bugs, too, which I am pleasantly surprised by. Some visual glitches here and there. But I've played other games release week, and they've been a lot messier than Hogwarts Legacy is. So uh, overall, I'm very impressed so far. How are you feeling, Micah? Yeah, I agree. I'm equally impressed. And what I really like about it is 
the time that you get to spend outside of Hogwarts. I know you were saying it's nice to roam around the castle, but not giving away any spoilers, even the way the game opens. And then obviously the ability to explore Hogsmeade and beyond, there's just so much to do. That's why I definitely don't think we'll all have it complete by episode 600, no. but <laughs> the detail is just amazing. And I think that um, to your point about how you can interact with other students, the the student that I interacted with the most so far is actually from Wagadu. I don't know if that is the same story for you. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. But yeah, the fact that they do incorporate other wizarding schools into this, I think the world is going to open up that much more in this game and it's going to be a lot of fun for people to play. Um, I'm still getting used to casting all these different spells. I think it's fun that as a fifth year, you have to learn everything kind of on this very fast paced um, curriculum. So interested to see where it all goes. The combat is very good. I've been pleasantly surprised by that. It takes a little bit of time to pick up and understand. And I'm right now getting my butt kicked in some scenarios. So I feel like I need to learn more spells before I continue, before I try to take on some of these uh, challenges. Like there's one fight way outside the castle that I cannot get past. I le- I'm like, I need, mm. and, and I see Expelliarmus coming up like in one of the quests. So I'm like, I think I need that first before I can actually <laughs> beat this one. Well, and I'm glad they have that little tracker that shows you where to go because I would get lost in this castle. I have no sense of direction oh, yeah. yet. Yeah, I don't know if I'm ever going to learn my way around the castle. <laughs> it is it is big and just like the way you you walk into one room and there's a set of staircases. This is actually in the hog's head too. Same case, same situation in the hog's head. You start going up flights of stairs, it just goes up and up and up and up and up. And I'm like shocked by how far up you go for at least right now not too much. And I bring that up just to say that there's a lot of places you can explore in this game. Yeah. A lot. And to your point about the controls i'm still very much used to having just played god of war so like i'm trying out those oh. controls <laughs> from like the muscle yeah. memory and it's not working and i'm saying why am i not casting a spell so um what what house did you get sorted did you end up just choosing Slytherin. Slytherin? now yeah i mean you can kind of it asks you like two questions during the sorting hat process and you kind of know which way they're leading questions however yeah. i will say i and i tweeted you this morning between now having been a hat stall on Pottermore between Ravenclaw and Slytherin and Hogwarts Legacy suggesting that I go into Slytherin, I don't know what to do. I mean, I chose hey. Ravenclaw, but I don't know. I'm feeling conflicted Are you about now. to switch house affiliation, Micah? <laughs> Come to Slytherin. Come to Slytherin. <laughs> Laura's ready to cancel you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and sorry, Laura, I think you were going to jump in earlier and I cut you off. I was actually going to ask... The question that you asked about, you know, where did y'all get sorted? Um, are you having fun exploring your various common rooms? That That's oh, something that I'm really rooms. excited about. I'm just blown away by the common rooms. They're all different, of course, right? The Slytherin one, it's, it's you know, when we read about it in the books and you see it in the movies, it's underground, it's dark. But what they did for the game is they brought light into it by putting giant windows looking into what I assume is supposed to be the Black Lake. So the common room is kind of lit by the sea. And then the music is just very soft and peaceful. It kind of reminds me, this might be a weird parallel to draw, but it kind of reminds me of like Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, like those scenes in terms of the the music from the movies, if I'm remembering correctly. But yeah, the common rooms are 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 beautiful. They are. Yeah. The Ravenclaw common room is really cool. And to Andrew's point earlier, there's so many staircases in the common room. Like I keep getting lost just within the common room itself. I don't know if it's like that for There's finally Justice 2 for there's a lot of uh yeah there's a lot of places to look they actually have an appropriate number of dormitories in each common room too (laughs) there's like it seems like there's like a good 10 dormitories in each common room and you can though my one issue with that is that while that's cool you go into each of the dormitories and they all look exactly the same so they kind of were lazy in that regard but in the movies you always wonder like where do all the students sleep you don't see the numerous dormitories they actually have them all in this game so it's just little mm. things like that they thought through. There are bathrooms you can go into. There are toilets. There, there are, are showers. 
<laughs> and people are making potion. Like I kicked open one stall and, and there's like a potion being brewed in there. That's funny. Jeez, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Just kicking in stalls. I didn't kick it open. You never you know, know what I you're going to find. Yeah, maybe right. there's some stuff to collect. I don't know. That's not what I was referring to. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. For Since I, I haven't played it yet, but storyline wise, we know that these games aren't supposed to be considered like canon, but based on what y'all are like seeing and everything, how is it fitting into the established rules of the wizarding world? Anything that's being overtly broken, anything like that? I don't think so. It's helpful that this is set in what, the late 1800s? Mm -hmm. So we're pretty far removed. There is a Weasley student in addition to the deputy headmistress being a Weasley. And I think the student said the Weasley deputy headmistress is his aunt. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you hit that part, Micah. Spoilers. Um, No, but that's But yeah, I, I don't think I don't I'm not seeing any other disruptions to like the plot. Or the overall core story so far. And I think it's just because it is so far apart. Yeah, there, there are definitely name drops that come throughout. I know we've talked about Phineas Nigellus Black is the headmaster of the school at the time. Yeah. Rookwood is a name that is dropped pretty frequently on the bad guy side of things. So I'm sure we'll run into more, but nothing that's really off-putting, at least not yet. There is a That's gaunt right. in Slytherin too. Slytherin students oh, oh, met him very early on. Yeah. So have y'all decided whether you're going to go the good path or the bad path yet? Do you know what you're doing? <laughs> I think there's just one path. Really? Some of the answers you can give, they they are some of like you can go in two different directions, but I think it puts you in the same place. It's just kind of like the attitude in terms of your responses to Got some of the characters. You. Yeah. Right, because the it's the goblin is the main baddie, right? Of this game, seems like. Yeah, and you do start encountering wizards too, who I guess they're associated. I don't know, but so we'll have um, more to say about the game, and obviously there's been some backlash that we'll speak to as well in episode 600. We'll spend a full episode talking about the game and and the fandom reaction to it. So uh, stay tuned for that on the landmark 600th episode. And by the way, that comes out April 4th. Hogwarts Legacy comes out April 4th for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, and then July 25th for Nintendo Switch. All right. Well, it's time to get into chapter by chapter, Laura. Yeah. So this week, we're going to be focusing on chapter 17 of Chamber of Secrets, The Heir of Slytherin. And we're going to kick it off with the seven word summary. Micah. You're in the hot seat to get us started. This is because of what Andrew and I did last week, isn't it? Yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) I came up with the order this week. I'll take the blame. All right. Memories. Reveal. Answers. About. Tom's. Legacy. I feel backed into a corner here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's it is okay. Fulfillment. <laughs> oh, fun. Okay. I was gonna I was I would have been lazy and just said hooray. <laughs> or, Ooh. I feel like we do that a lot though. So I was like, oh, I'm not gonna throw the hooray in there. We gotta save Thank that. Thank you. Yeah, we gotta save that for a moment where there's really nowhere else to take it. Memories reveal answers about Tom's legacy fulfillment. I'll take it. Yeah. You know, I, I think smooth. we we can give it um what an acceptable achieved sure. expectations. Um, achieved. We achieved. We something. achieved. <laughs> Listen, we all got up on Saturday morning to record the episode. So I think That's we definitely did achieve something. <laughs> yeah. We were all talking about how old we are before it started, too. Oh, yes. <laughs> indeed. So we begin this chapter with Harry entering the Chamber of Secrets, and he is greeted by a full body, massive statue of Salazar Slytherin. Ginny's body, her unconscious body, is laying between Slytherin's feet at the base of the statue. He attempts to wake her. He's worried that she might be dead. He's not even sure if she is alive at this point. And while he fruitlessly attempts to wake her, Tom Riddle emerges from the shadows. 
And Harry notes that Tom looks strangely blurred around the edges. Um, you know, he's not quite, he looks like he's not quite there, but he's not quite like a ghost either. Harry even asks him if he's a ghost and Riddle says that he's a memory that had been preserved in a diary for 50 years. Very interesting because we know that uh, this isn't just a memory, it's a horcrux. And I wanted to kick off the discussion by asking how self-aware are horcruxes? Does this version of Tom Riddle know that he's a horcrux? It seems that he has a very interesting awareness of time, both past, present, and future. He's referring to Dumbledore as the Transfiguration Professor, but he also seems to have an accurate accounting of his own downfall at the hands of Harry. I think we can assume that Ginny provided those details, but it just seems interesting to me that he describes some things based on present day details and some based on details from the past. There's even one point where he says to Harry, Twice in your past, in my future, we have met and twice I have failed to kill you. So what is up with this? (laughs) (laughs) I missed that when I was reading the chapter for today. So I was like, whoa, this kind of like explains everything. It it reveals the future. I mean, couldn't you take this and assume that this was kind of foreshadowing the end of Harry Potter, too? I mean, sure, he said twice, but. I don't know. You could just ignore this instance in Chamber of Secrets when uh, he fails to kill Harry and just jump ahead to the future. Seems like a huge spoiler. Right. I didn't even think about it that way. The way I interpreted it was that he was talking about when Harry was a baby and the end of Sorcerer's Stone. But when you think about it, (laughs) there are a lot of instances he could be referring to here. Yeah. 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 I definitely took it as he, he like Ginny has given him the download about everything that has been happening with Harry. And I think he's referencing baby Harry and end of Sorcerer's Stone Harry. Mm -hmm. At least I hope. In terms of what's going on in Riddle's mind, I think it's just like you said, Laura, Ginny is providing a lot of the details for him and he's been heavily influenced there. It might be similar, but not entirely equal to how Horcrux Harry seems to give Harry some instinct and direction like will occur later in this chapter and like occurred a few chapters ago, as we had discussed at the time. So I think there's some internal compass guiding him as well. Yeah. Right. Especially given that we're told in this chapter that literally the life force of Ginny is leaving her and flowing into Tom Riddle. So even things that she didn't write in the diary that she just knows from her own day-to-day existence, you would assume are flowing out of her and into Tom Riddle. So True. that could also be how he's learning more uh, of this information. But I do kind of like this idea of Horcrux is having self-awareness. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I mean, we do see evidence that when you destroy a Horcrux, for example, we see this in in book seven, I think, Voldemort has a, a very visceral physical reaction to one of his Horcruxes being destroyed. So it does raise the question, are the Horcruxes all aware of each other? Is it just sort of like the big baddie V himself who has awareness of what's going on with the Horcruxes? Do the Horcruxes know what's going on with each other? It's interesting, and it made me wonder if the Horcruxes have a hive mind. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm I'm imagining this brain that like connects them all. That's kind of cool to think about. I don't know if we get many clues that way that they all can sense what's going on. But on the on the other hand, it's like Harry can sense what Voldemort's feeling, and Voldemort certainly is able to try to penetrate Harry's mind. So there, I don't know, but that's like from Horcrux to Creator. Not Horcrux to Horcrux. There Mm. has to be some kind of hive mind, though, because otherwise, how would Tom Riddle know that Harry would be a person for him that he's most anxious to meet? Unless there's some flow of information that's going on, because that Horcrux was made years, 50 years before Harry even steps foot inside Hogwarts. And I don't know how many years before Voldemort kills 
Harry's parents. So how does this Tom Riddle even know about Harry in that sense? I mean, I don't know that Ginny sat there and wrote about how Harry killed Voldemort, right? So how does this version of Voldemort even know about Harry? Yeah, he's kind of obsessed with him. You don't think Ginny could have told him? Not that. I, I don't think so. No. Yeah. Do I mean, it's a question of do we think Ginny literally wrote a history of what happened with Harry? Right. And like, the hey, downfall Tom, of Harry killed you. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> I kind of think that that is what happened. Uh, we have to remember that this is a this is a post Voldemort world. Right. And so. Every young child knows this story about the Dark Lord and the idea of Tom Riddle just being like, look, I'm 50. I'm like a a memory or something from like a long time ago. Tell me what has happened to Voldemort. Where is he? Is he still alive? And Jenny just being like, here's exactly what happened. There was this guy named or this baby named Harry Potter and he's dead. And because by this time, Voldemort has already been using his moniker, uh, that that title. So I don't think it would be so odd for him to phrase it this way, as in like, this is such a big, impactful person in your history. He, uh, hopefully he knows that. And he could just be like, what happened to Voldemort? That's a really good point, actually, because it is established, um, you know, going into the next chapter a little bit that most people don't know that Tom Riddle and Voldemort are the same person. So if Tom were to be asking Ginny, hey, what happened to that guy? Ginny's not going to have any idea that he's talking about himself. So I think that's that's a point well taken. Yeah, but- I agree. I, I just think it's interesting to explore the other side of it, too. Mm-hmm. And also, we know that part of Voldemort is living within Harry. Is that sort of the connection here where there is information unknowingly being sent from that Horcrux within Harry to the Tom Riddle diary Horcrux. It's possible. Mm -hmm. Especially since they're in such close proximity to each other. Harry even has it for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. But Tyler, you have some interesting notes here about this Horcrux's motivations that I want to get into. Yeah, it's when I was rereading this this chapter, something that really stood out to me was the the emphasis on why he preserved this part of himself, right? He keeps using the phrase memory. We don't obviously know what a Horcrux is at this point, but he keeps saying, I preserved myself. I preserved my 16-year-old memory myself. And he keeps saying that he's doing it to continue Salazar Slytherin's noble work and Sal- Salazar Slytherin's work. And it just really felt like a very big 180 from what we later learned that Voldemort was deeply, deeply afraid of death. And he wanted to create Horcruxes to ensure his longevity of his life. But here, it was so stark that he, at least in the dialogue that we got, we could talk about his motivations, but it felt like he was truly just wanting to stay around to continue Salazar Slytherin's work, not because he was afraid of death. Could he be hiding his big fear, his number one phobia? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But I think it is an interesting point to observe that at the same time that this version of Tom Riddle seems to have kind of a global awareness of what's going on with the Dark Lord present day, but his motivations are still rooted in what his 16-year-old self was doing 50 years ago at Hogwarts. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, to Tyler's question, we're looking at kind of like a tape recording of Tom Riddle. His motivations in the Harry Potter series are the ones he had 50 years ago. And it's just as simple as that. Mm -hmm. That kind of leads me to the other question that I had about this. We don't know a lot about the process of, of making a Horcrux or even how the the reincarnation process of a Horcrux happens. I've always wondered what was the end goal here, right? Because throughout this chapter, we're seeing Harry notice that Tom Riddle's silhouette is becoming a little bit more defined, right? With every passing moment, those edges become a little less blurry as if he is fully reincarnating himself. What would have been the end result here? Would this Horcrux have been a fully sentient, fleshed out version of Tom Riddle leading to the present day Voldemort that we know 
the old man who's in hiding and this young Tom Riddle? Like, or would they have fused together at some point? What was the end result of this magic? No, we only fuse together in Deathly Hallows Part 2, thanks to David Yates. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> this Horcrux was created to preserve the nose. Maybe that's what would have come of this. Voldemort would have had a nose. This is such a really interesting question, though, too, because would you essentially have two versions of Voldemort existing at the same time? We know why he created the Horcrux is to essentially achieve immortality, and I don't think he ever really assumed that they would be found much less destroyed. So I, I don't really have an answer. Like We don't know enough about Horcrux magic to really take a good stab at this. That's my feeling. <laughs> neither neither does this. Harry, but he, <laughs> he manages to. <laughs> yeah. It's a really interesting question. It is because this is the only Horcrux that produces something like this. Yeah. A, a sentient version of Voldemort that we can see and talk to, right? Mm -hmm. A corporeal, right? Isn't that the right. like a, a Patronus that takes a form, right? Very similar. This is a co corporeal Horcrux. Right. What do you think, Tyler? How would they have merged or not merged? Yeah. I've I've tried to give this some thought and it's so shrouded in just lack of information because I've always viewed at least the the other Horcruxes. I viewed them as say this main version of Voldemort were to like die that that soul that is preserved within that object then just like feeds into the main one. And so even if he were to like yeah. you know, turn into like that ethereal whatever thing, this the soul that's in that object comes out and is like, okay, my turn. I'm going to reinvigorate you based on the soul that you have. But then that, that kind of, there's a wrench thrown in that when we talk about this version of the Horcrux and the magic and needing to feed life off of somebody else. It's like, what is happening? Yeah, I do think they would merge. As egotistical as Voldemort is, I don't think he would want two of himself. I think he wants one Voldemort. There's there's definitely something special about this Horcrux, though. Clearly, it's the first one he's created, but th this is the first kind of ripping of the soul. So it's definitely interesting to look at this one in comparison to the others that he created. I wonder if he was more practiced, he took more time with this one, where maybe in other situations he was a bit more rushed. Uh, and as he continues to rip the soul, maybe just the Horcruxes aren't as powerful as, you know, point. you move along and you start to create as many of them as he did. But yeah, I, I like that idea of whatever is left, that essence of Voldemort that's out there would find its way back to a fully corporeal Tom Riddle Jr. Like, and they would kind of merge together. Yeah. So we know, um, and we've established this, that the reason that this version of Tom is growing stronger is because um, he is literally sapping the life out of Ginny Weasley. He says, I grew stronger and stronger on a diet of her deepest fears and her darkest secrets. And we know um, from this horrible moment where he's mocking her in the chamber as she literally lays nearly dead on the floor. He's mocking her for not feeling like she fits in at Hogwarts because she has to wear secondhand robes. Her brothers tease her. She has this unrequited love for Harry Potter. And I was just wondering, I have a little what if here. <laughs> What if Jenny had found fulfillment and happiness instead of being teased by her brothers, uh, feeling like she didn't fit in at Hogwarts, and if she wasn't harboring these unrequited feelings for Harry, would Riddle have been able to find a way to manipulate her otherwise, or would he have needed to find a way to get the diary into someone else's hands? So I'm going to actually quote him here. And in this chapter, he says, I've always been able to charm the people I needed. Uh, and so I think he would have found a way if, in fact, he felt Ginny was the right person. I just don't think that he would have been so apt to move on to another person. 
We know that in that moment, he's referring to Ginny, but we see this in Half-Blood Prince. He manipulates Slughorn. He manipulates Hepzibah Smith. In Deathly Hallows, we learn about how he manipulated the Grey Lady. So he is a master manipulator and he has the charm. So even if it wasn't Ginny, it would have been somebody else. He he clearly has that quality to his personality that he's able to take advantage of others. I, I do think he definitely would have had to go elsewhere, though, if what Laura is saying were true. Ginny found fulfillment and happiness, and she had others around her who were just bringing joy. I mean, she turned to this diary because she didn't have anybody else to share her feelings with. You couldn't see him playing on that, though. Like, oh, are you really happy? I you guess. Know, but why like... is he? Why would she even be going to the diary to begin with? If she's got other stuff going on, if she could still write in a diary, keep diaries when I mean, you're happy, right? No, I, I, I know, mm-hmm. but that diary with that voice talking back. I yeah. also think we have to remember that Tom does not understand happiness. Happiness and love was his downfall, ultimately. So I think it might have been, might have been a harder egg for him to crack, you know. But the reason I ask this is there is one moment uh, in the book, a couple chapters earlier, where Draco has the diary for a split second. And it's always been interesting to me to consider the the possibilities if Draco had kept the diary, um, because he saw how sort of horrified both Harry and Ginny were that he had his hands on it. Um, you know, what if Harry hadn't been able to disarm him ultimately and take it back. I could see Draco being someone who would be very vulnerable to this diary, particularly considering the connections between books two and six. If there's one thing that Voldemort, Tom Riddle specifically, can do, it's manipulate people. Mm -hmm. And Hepzibah Smith, I think, is a perfect example of that. Here she is. She's this rich, um, very important member of this very important family with great lineage and all this stuff. And Tom Riddle wasn't necessarily able to take advantage of her via, um, you know, preying on her insecurities. He was able to charm her in a way like I I think this version of Tom would not have been able to prey on Ginny in the way that he did here if if she were happy but i do think that he would have found another way to take advantage of her another way Mm -hmm. not as manipulative but i'm your best friend oh my gosh tell me everything you know something like that i think gossipy yeah we we do a disservice if we don't acknowledge just how charming Tom Riddle is in addition yeah. to manipulative. <laughs> okay, super fan. <laughs> no, he he is though. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's straight from the text for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In 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 the Discord, into the Wicked Wood said he'd probably twist every situation she talked about to make it look like everyone was against her, and he tried to make her miserable and bitter. That's mm-hmm. fair. I really like the whole Draco storyline because he would have likely completely messed up his father's plans uh, in one way or another. But let's assume that he follows the same path as Ginny and he's the one that gets taken into the chamber. Uh, I liked what you were saying early, Laura, because it is a direct tie to um, Half-Blood Prince, right? Like he is being kind of taken down this dark path that you know, maybe in Chamber of Secrets, he would have been excited about, but come Half-Blood Prince, when he's being forced into this Death Eater circle, he really doesn't want any of it. Right. And I think that he would arrive at a similar conclusion had he been Tom Riddle's victim in this book, right? Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately, Tom Riddle doesn't care whether the person he's using is a Slytherin, a Gryffindor, a Half-Blood a pure, pure blood. blood it doesn't matter you know he i think he's happy to prey on whoever is going to be most beneficial to him at mm. the moment so it, it would just be interesting for draco's character arc to consider the possibilities here particularly given the fact that we know when this book was originally being written there were elements from half blood prince that were, you know, they're deeply connected to this book because we know there were things that 
potentially could have happened in this book that ended up being held for half blood prince. Right. Yeah. Totally. Mm-hmm. I mean, this whole conversation that we're having now with the knowledge of Horcruxes is a totally different conversation than we would have had having just read the second book and having nothing after <laughs> to, to to inform it. This this Draco conversation is so interesting because it you th- you extrapolate that and you think about the series of events that would have happened after this had Draco become disillusioned about the Dark Lord so much sooner, right? We we probably wouldn't have have gotten uh, Half Blood Prince Draco. Dumbledore might have died a different way. Yeah. There there are just so many things that it's like, ooh, how how fascinating that would have been mm-hmm. to know that one of the most self self conscious characters in Harry Potter, like Draco, would be so quickly disillusioned by Voldemort. Yeah, and having to live with the fact that Harry saved his life so oh, early yeah. in the series, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, would Harry have gone into the chamber if it was Draco? Probably not. I think so. <laughs> I think yeah. so. Harry has a saving people thing. Yeah. <sighs> and look, he, he helped uh, Draco at the end of the series. So like Laura said, saving people thing and getting into danger thing. He's got to. Well, Micah, you were talking about the past maybe informing the future there a moment ago. And I thought you had an interesting point here about Harry sharing some information with Riddle. Yeah, it goes back to that whole Horcrux hive mind conversation. And I was wondering, should Harry have told Voldemort what he knew about his downfall? Because there's this moment where Harry is just kind of saying, okay, the more I talk to him, the more time I buy for myself and for Ginny. Uh, But he lets it slip about his mother's protection. And I'm wondering if that informed future actions if we're to assume that these horcruxes are all kind of connected to each other was there some way of this diary horcrux being able to disseminate out that information to the other versions of voldemort that are out there that that is in fact how voldemort fell it was because of lily potter's protection i think we could maybe it's a bit of a stretch but i don't know um It's interesting to consider, is this why Voldemort, um, his plan ultimately in Goblet of Fire was to remake his body using Harry's blood so that he would have the blood protection that would allow him to touch Harry, right? Because at this point in the series, he can't. Right. So does this, what Harry tells him here... Is this what kind of informs that decision in Goblet of Fire? I mean, it's possible. It's also possible that he gets that information from the Death Eaters that are helping to bring him back Mm -hmm. to life. Because I I do think there is there is like a wider knowledge about how um, Voldemort fell, and so I don't think it's impossible that the information came from like a Barty Crouch Jr. or a Peter Pettigrew, but. There is something interesting just to think about here that Harry is willingly giving this information over to Tom Riddle. And and to Laura's point, we know that it's made a point that his blood be used in the resurrection of Voldemort in Goblet of Fire. There are so many different ways that he could have received this information, but this one is the most direct, right? He Mm. could have, when he was on the backside of Quirrell's head, you know, he could have asked Quirrell to like go ask Dumbledore about Harry's protection or, you know, if Harry shared with Ron and Hermione about what what Dumbledore had told Harry at the end of Philosopher's Stone and is like, hey, my mom's love or sacrifice is what protected me. And there's scabbers right there listening to all this, you know, there I feel like there are a bunch of indirect ways that he could have got this. But this one is actually Harry telling this Horcrux. And if they are connected. Well, there you go. Somewhere where Voldemort's like ethereal body is like hiding, he's like listening in and is like, oh, okay, cool. New plan. Right. Yeah. So should Harry have told Voldemort? No. Mm-mm. But hashtag Harry's a child, a 12 year old. <laughs> he's buying time too. He's doing the yeah. best. He yeah. He's buying time. Yeah. And he's probably prideful of how his mom saved him. So he naturally wants to. There's also it. the chance that this version of Tom Riddle just isn't in the know. And is looking for information yeah. as to why his 
later self ultimately fell. Oh, uh, yeah. Again, he's like a he's a version of himself from 50 years ago. Well, and he's also probably trying to buy time, right? Like he's probably uh-huh. trying to keep Harry talking because the longer he keeps Harry talking and he keeps this from, you know, devolving into a conflict, the more of Ginny Weasley he saps away and gets stronger and stronger. So there may be an element of that at play, too. Well, we learn ultimately that Ginny Weasley is the one who opened the Chamber of Secrets. She strangled the roosters, painted the messages on the walls from the air, and ultimately sent the basilisk after its victims. That all makes a lot of sense. I do have a question, though. It mentions that she lost her sense of memory and finds herself in these peculiar situations. She finds herself with feathers all over her robes and paint down her front. I'm very curious how no one noticed this, especially her dormitory mates. Yeah, yeah. Because when I wake up with feathers all over me and paint, I normally have an excuse, but she definitely <laughs> right. can't remember. I guess she was making up an excuse too. Well, what What is that excuse? I'm curious. What were you doing the night before? I was partying on a farm that I was <laughs> repainting. <laughs> As you do. That's what they always <laughs> say, Andrew. Right. That's what I they was always repainting say. a barn. That was quick thinking. I'll accept that for now. <laughs> <laughs> maybe people did. Maybe she washed off quick enough. And if people did notice, then she just came up with some sort of excuse. And it probably wasn't a very good excuse because she had to think in the moment. And the kids may have noticed, but would they have cared that much? Like, oh, that's just Hogwarts. You get up to some strange things around this school. Yeah. That's true. We also don't hear a, a lot about. Ginny's friends throughout. And this actually made me think about Luna Lovegood and how she is kind of the oddball out. And I'm wondering too, maybe early on, if Ginny was in kind of the same boat and that's what ultimately drew them together to become friends. Mm -hmm. Ginny is the Luna Lovegood of the Gryffindor house. Yeah. Well, at least in terms of like waking up with feathers and paint all over her, that seems like something Luna would do, but would not care what anybody thought about. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she clearly just doesn't have many friends at this stage in the series. That obviously changes later on. Um, Mm -hmm. But at this point, we also learn the truth of who Tom Riddle really is. He's Voldemort. And Andrew has put together um, some really interesting information about how uh, that uh, it's an anagram, right? is portrayed in (laughs) other books um, and even some other potential interpretations of that. But I thought (laughs) I thought we could speak first about the signs that Tom Riddle is Voldemort. A couple of notes here that really stuck out to me were his high cold laugh. That's something that is often described you know, with Voldemort and those interactions, his fascination with Harry, he's really obsessed with him. Uh, Like Mike, I think noted earlier on in the episode, um, he mentioned that Harry was the person that he was the most anxious to meet and talk to. And even his choice of words sounds very in character for Voldemort when he's talking about Hagrid and, you know, Hagrid being the person that he frames for opening the chamber 50 years ago. Um, he notes that he was surprised that it worked out as well as it did and says, you know, as though Hagrid had the brains or the power to do what I did. So right. these are things that are very much in keeping with that character. I know some other folks have notes, too. Well, I'm just curious, and, and this is maybe just digging into the details, but if Hagrid didn't have the brains or the power, why was he a good person to frame? Like, you would think that more people would catch on to that. Like, did he have a bad reputation? Yeah, I mean- Well, the reason Hagrid was a good pick was because he can be a bit sloppy with his handling of creatures, and we know that he loves creatures. He's also a convenient scapegoat. Yeah, I was. I was also. He also gonna... doesn't have the brains to properly uh, dig himself out of the hole. Right. True. Oh, Hagrid. And, and there's probably some, sorry, buddy. I love you. Some <laughs> bias here as well, too, on the part of those that are uh, in power, like Dippet, seeing a half giant and saying, "Oh, he's a big kid." Like, sure, he opened the chamber, and his monsters were responsible for what happened. But yep. it's just one of those things where you're saying to yourself, "Well, if he's not the smartest." sharpest knife in the drawer, you know, why did they opt to frame him? So 
Yeah. I don't remember if I saw this coming. I don't think I did because I do remember and I was again blown away with the movie when the anagram reveal occurred. Um, I just thought that was the coolest thing. I love how they do it in the movie too, with the letters moving around, rearranging themselves. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I I think I do remember little me being blown away by like, whoa, the answer was right there in front of us the whole time in his darn name. I felt the same way. I had, I first read this when I was 11 years old. I did not see this coming. (laughs) I read this in third grade and I, think I learned what an anagram was because of this book. I didn't even know that you could <laughs> like rearrange things and make other things. I was like, whoa. And so when they did this in the book, I remember taking a piece of paper. I was sitting at my desk and I did Tom Marvolo Riddle. And then I did I Am Lord Voldemort. And I drew all the lines that connected. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, nothing will be a bigger reveal Mind than blown. this. This is huge. That's amazing. Yeah. So definitely did not connect this or predict that Tom Riddle was Voldemort at all. <laughs> I saw the movie first, so <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> knew what was coming. Getting back to Tyler's story, when would you learn anagrams? You said you were in third grade, so maybe fourth or fifth grade. I feel like you would learn that in elementary school, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Let's take a quick break to talk about this week's sponsor, Indeed. Hiring for your business can feel harder than cracking open the mystery of the Chamber of Secrets. But now I actually look forward to hiring because I use Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Hate waiting? Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. I love Indeed's Instant Match feature. Candidates you invite to apply through Instant Match are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to U.S. Indeed data. The right candidate is doing everything they can to find you. And if you use Indeed, you can be sure you're doing everything you can to find them too. Indeed knows that finding people with the right skills makes all the difference when you're a hiring team of one. Visit Indeed.com slash MuggleCast to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash mugglecast. Indeed.com slash mugglecast. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Before we get to more about the anagram, Laura, do you want to walk us through some uh, threads? Yeah, there are quite a few threads that we can connect here. First of all, um, Fox playing such a prominent part in this chapter in Chamber of Secrets, and then later on in Half Blood Prince. Um, it, it is an interesting sort of, um, comparison to draw, uh, between the two because Fox is so integral in this chapter in keeping Harry alive. Um, but then his, his sort of big moment in, uh, Half-Blood Prince is reacting to Dumbledore's death. So it's very interesting to see life and death as contrasting themes at these points in the series. Um, But I also know Micah and Tyler, um, y'all had some points about Fox and the connections between books two and six. Yeah. I mean, it would have been great, much like what he does to the basilisk and poking its eyes out if he did the same to Snape at the end of half Blood (laughs) Prince, but (laughs) he doesn't do that, unfortunately. Uh, But yeah, I mean, much like we talked about in the last episode, there is like this Dumbledore thread um, that exists between these two books, right? The chapter we talked about last week, the mood after he leaves is very somber and you can tie that to what happens in in Half-Blood Prince after his death. But I think the loyalty to him um, is something that really shines through in this chapter in particular, right? That's why Falk shows up uh, in the first place to assist Harry. And I think that just loyalty to Dumbledore is an ongoing theme, um, maybe more so towards the end of Half-Blood Prince and then going into Deathly Hallows because it's this trust factor that Dumbledore knows what the hell he's doing that keeps Harry on his quest. Um, And, you know, they do kind of question it at times, but ultimately they kind of follow through on what what his ultimate plan was. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that when in this chapter, 
we're seeing Fox interacting with the old version, this memory of of Tom Riddle. And in Half-Blood Prince, oftentimes when Harry and Dumbledore are exploring these memories, the history of who Voldemort was and how he came to be, oftentimes when they come out of the Pensieve, there Harry often notes you know fox over there quietly cooing or you know just mm-hmm. being there there's this there's this presence of fox whenever there's the discussion or the interaction with the history of who voldemort is kind of in my head symbolizing that rebirth that change the death and life and so it's all it's always fun to see how fox comes about whenever we talk about tom riddle and who voldemort was that is interesting i hadn't drawn that um that comparison but you're right you're right he's almost always there always there (laughs) we also get a lot of teenage riddle um between this chapter and then later on in half-blood prince and micah you've already noted that we get some great examples in this chapter of how riddle was really able to charm and manipulate the people that he needed and that is Absolutely substantiated later on in Half Blood Prince, as we've established. Um, there's also this likeness that is drawn between Harry and Riddle. They're both half bloods, they're both orphans, raised by muggles, they're parcel mouths. And Riddle even notes that they look something alike, which is interesting since we learn um, in book seven that they are actually distantly related. Um, via the Peveril brothers. So it is established very early on in the series that these two have more in common than I think meets the eye. Um, We also get the sort of Gryffindor, which plays a major role here, as well as in Deathly Hallows. Um, And then learning that basilisk fangs can be used to destroy horcruxes, which again comes in really handy in Deathly Hallows. Did I have a question about this, though? Um, If Fox had not saved Harry, if Harry had died in the Chamber of Secrets, if he had died from basilisk venom in this book, wouldn't Voldemort have died, too? Because of the prophecy, neither shall live while the other survives. Oh, this could have ended the series very early. (laughs) The two book epic tale. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Scholastic was like, these books aren't selling. We got to end this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That maybe that's the alternate ending they had waiting in the wings just in case. Uh-huh. I, I definitely think the Horcrux within Harry would have died too, but Voldemort still is out there somewhere, right? And presumably Tom Riddle would have triumphed in this moment if Harry had died. So. I think Voldemort would have lived on. He still has other Horcruxes too. So he's still anchored to life in some way. It's just that one of the vessels and that vessel being Harry is now dead. So Voldemort wins. (laughs) True. Yeah. Oh man. So it just would have been, oh, the series would have ended with Voldemort day being established. Yeah. That would have happened long before (laughs) Cursed Child. Cursed Child would have never happened. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I know too that J.K. Rowling said that the reason the Horcrux within Harry wasn't destroyed by the Basilisk by the Basilisk's venom is because Fox healed him, so he essentially mm-hmm. healed the horse. So blame Fox; it's all his fault. <laughs> the vessel was not destroyed. Correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Fox does drop the diary into Harry's lap, and then. Quote, without thinking, without considering, as though he had meant to do it all along, Harry seized the basilisk fang on the floor next to him and plugged it straight into the heart of the book. Does it say plugged or plunged? I wonder if that I was think an auto. I think it's plunged. Plunged. Okay. I may have mistyped that. Um, so is this Horcrux Harry talking again? Without thinking, without considering, as though he had meant to do it all along, Harry seized the basilisk fang and plunged it into the book. It's the Horcrux hive mind. Horcrux hive mind. Kill it. Kill it. Would the hive mind say kill it? <laughs> no. would have thought that, right? It would have been like, so. no, no, no. Like, you're having this thought. Don't have this thought. Yeah, like no, its no, hand no. would yeah. have shaken up here and like not, mm-hmm. not followed through on the motion. His arm would overextend backwards. And <laughs> needs more skeletal grow. Oh, my gosh. I do think this is Horcrux Harry talking again, though now that we're talking about the hive mind, maybe not. I mean, maybe it just 
gives almost an unconscious level of awareness that it is a horcrux. Maybe there is some unconscious recognition. And because it's unconscious, Harry's conscious mind is able to rise above it and say, okay, I'm going to stab the the bleep out of this thing. I'm thinking like unconscious thought coming from the back of his head, like Horcrux bad must kill. Yeah. Well, especially after what just happened to him, right? Like he has been stabbed with this. So he figures, let me try this out on this diary and see if the same thing happens. Let me take us down a weird road then. (laughs) What if this Horcrux, the one that's in the diary, which we know has the most amount of Voldemort's soul, what if this piece of Horcrux went rogue? And that's why we're seeing this weird, only once corporeal Horcrux version of of Voldemort. And the hive mind is like, oh no, we have to get rid of this rogue one that wants to take out the actual oh, that's main fun. soul. Yeah, yeah, he's a threat. And so the, the the Horcrux Harry is like, quick, stab this to get rid of this this tr- like traitor, this rogue piece of soul. Horcruxes assemble. <laughs> Let's bring it down. It's gone rogue. No, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, th- this makes me think too. Like, I love that. Why would a why would the basilisk venom harm the Horcrux? You'd think it would strengthen it in some way. I mean, they're both evil. Uh, that's yeah, kind of the, basilisk, the direction I'm going in. Yeah, but the basilisk fang kills. It kills anything. Just take the Horcrux out of it. It's a blade. It's a weapon. It's venomous. But in this case, what I'm I guess where I'm going with it is like the basilisk was used to create this horcrux right the diary kills myrtle voldemort creates the horcrux i just feel like something from the basilisk wouldn't destroy the horcrux it would make it stronger i don't know are you trying to say like like real recognizes real kind of thing like evil <laughs> recognizes yeah. evil and or makes it even stronger <laughs> legalized gillyweed says horcrux vaccine but it's it's still plunging into a diary and physically destroying it you know it's not like a pillow that's just slapping up against the diary it's still a weapon <laughs> so maybe it has no choice even if it didn't want to destroy it yeah i mean the thing is though it's not as though basilisk venom is what killed myrtle it was the basilisk's gaze so if he right? stabbed it with the eyes then it would have reinforced <laughs> the diary strength there you go maybe but the eyes are poked but out f- fox ate them yeah yeah so <laughs> tom riddle is defeated lockhart's memory is wiped clean It's time to get back to the more comforting areas of Hogwarts, and we'll do that next chapter. But I wanted to return to the Tom Marvolo Riddle anagrams. Just real quick before we go on, did anybody else have visions of just like Fox waddling down the hallway, like leading (laughs) this group to the staff room, or is that just me? Let's go home, guys. Like I can't say (laughs) he's like a Pokemon that's just like leading them to where they need to. I don't know. That was (laughs) that's fun. No, I like that. Have you ever seen a bird walk? They they look kind of goofy when they yeah. walk, and it's like I could see Fox doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, like Big Bird. Anyway, sorry. leading them. Go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> no, it's okay. So maybe some people have considered like, can Tom Marvolo Riddle turn into anything else besides I am Lord Voldemort? And it turns out many years ago, someone named Katie Rose tried to figure out those alternate anagrams, and. This person, Katie, did this really great art. Maybe we can share this on social media this week, just showing Tom Riddle working through all the different options and like sketching out thoughts. And some of these are graphic and I will not be reading them, but they were real (laughs) anagrams that worked out. Come on. Sorry, Micah. Sorry, Micah. (laughs) Here are some of the alternate anagrams and these are kid friendly. Lord Earldom Vomit. Immortal Love Rod, R-O-D-D. Oh, that's kid appropriate. Yeah, Yeah, I don't think that's kid appropriate. (laughs) Rod, R-O-D-D. It's somebody's name. Mild Doormat Lover. That's my favorite one. Dermal Drool Vomit. Old Immortal Lover. Mild More Dad Lover. (laughs) (laughs) And Vim Troll Dad Romeo. Oh, and 
marmot drool devil and the rest of these have have a phallic object in them <laughs> so, <laughs> so those are some alternates if uh tom didn't like lord voldemort he has some other ones like immortal love rod and mild doormat lover i don't hate old immortal lover because <laughs> knowing voldemort's like intentions to live forever uh... yeah that kind of works. He who shall not be named. Old immortal lover. <laughs> and then these come up from time to time. I thought we should read through some of them again, though I will butcher some of these. I apologize. But talking about international Tom Riddle anagrams from other translations of the book outside of English, because other languages needed to change Tom Riddle's name in order to get to the translation for I am Lord Voldemort. So in French, and this one gets memed from time to time, that uh, his name was Tom Elvis. Jouet de Sour? Jouet de Sour? We need Chloe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in Spanish, it was Tom Sorvolo Riddle, Riddle with a Y. In Italian, Tom Orvolosun Riddle. In German, Tom Vorlost Riddle. In Turkish, Tom Marvoldo Riddle. That that's pretty good. Yeah, Brazilian Portuguese is very similar to the um to the Spanish version. Spelling's a little different. Um Tom Servolo Riddle. Um Slovenian, we have Mark Nielsen. <laughs> that one's <laughs> that such one's a too, departure. <laughs> yeah, that one's too friendly <laughs> and like average. <laughs> no, not the Dark Lord Mark. <laughs> no, not Mark. Hi, Mark. Uh, Hi, Mark. I like the Swedish version has four four words. Tom Gus Mervolo Dolder. That yeah. one that one's interesting. Yeah. I think it all has to do with the translations of how you say I am mm-hmm. in languages. Okay. Cause like with like Tom Sorvolo Riddle, like the reason that Y is in there for Spanish is because he would have to say Soy Lord Voldemort. Mm. So S O Y. So they have to get creative with some of these spellings to work in that I am for for the languages where there's only two names we know that Marvolo is obviously uh you know Voldemort's family name or his dad right mm-hmm. yep where where do these fall in like in the Icelandic version is his relative's name Trevor because there's only two two I words guess. oh uh, yeah that's a good or like question Mark is his relative's name just Mark Mark Gaunt? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Trevor. So anyway, these are fun to look at. Should we call this week's episode Old Immortal Lover? Sure. Yep. <laughs> okay. Perfect. I mean, you could go with, what is it? <laughs> Immortal Love Rod. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. You thought I was going to say one of the bad ones, but I won't. I did. Uh, I, I did. did. People are yep. going to be like, what? Immortal? Save these for a bonus muggle cast. We can throw these into the Valentine's Day one. Mark Nielsen, the immortal love rod. Yeah. Mark <laughs> Nielsen. <laughs> oh, that's that's a title. Mark Nielsen. And people are going to be like so confused. They're gonna what play going to hit play to understand what the heck happened on this week's episode. There's like, wow. who is this guest? Mark Nielsen? <laughs> All right, well, just a couple quick odds and ends I found. Plus one for the non-existent, I'm going to be expelled count that I've been referencing from time to time. But this time it's Ginny who thinks she's going to be expelled. And once again, they're not. But she has good reason. <laughs> well, she yeah. she has good reason, but I don't think Dumbledore for a second would consider actually expelling her. It wasn't her fault. We'll find out next chapter. Woo. <laughs> yeah and then i just wanted to read this quote harry i think myrtle's grown fond of you you've got competition jenny and it's not so much foreshadowing but a teaser of myrtle's future thirsting over harry which we really see in the movies i don't know if it's as emphasized in the book i can't remember but just a little uh sneak peek of what's to come and poor jenny being teased again i know as if Mm. she didn't have a hard enough go around this year so let's move on to mvp of the week and i'm gonna give it to the sorting hat for being able to hold more than house assignments i'm gonna give it to fox for literally saving the day 
I'm going to give it to Tom Riddle for establishing that Horcruxes can be destroyed before we even know what Horcruxes are. <laughs> and I'm going to give it to the Basilisk for being the biggest hype man and always following orders. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Next week is the final chapter in Chamber of Secrets, chapter 18. So we will discuss that final chapter and we'll offer some overall thoughts on the book like we did at the end of Sorcerer's Stone. And then, like I said, at the top of today's episode in two weeks for episode 600, we will review Hogwarts Legacy. And we are hoping to bring back a co-host from MuggleCast Pass for that one to celebrate that milestone episode. If you have any feedback about today's episode or the chapters ahead, you can send an owl to mugglecast at gmail.com or you can use the contact form on mugglecast.com. You can also send us a voice message. Just record it using the voice memo app on your phone and then email us that file. Or you can use our phone number, which is 19203Muggle. In the US, that's 19203684453. It's time for our Harry Potter trivia game quizage. Last week's question, who really opened the Chamber of Secrets 50 years ago? <laughs> Easiest question <laughs> ever. Eric going for the easy questions while he is not Suspicious. with Suspicious. us this week. So, of course, uh, the answer is Hagrid, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> wow. Correct answers were submitted by Legalized Gillyweed. Riddle me this. Lockhart's memory charm. You're a quizard, Harry. I would follow the spiders if it meant finding Muggle cast. Artemis Fido Jr. the second. Is that a wand in your pocket? Tom Riddle did nothing wrong. Tyler would agree with that, I'm sure. <laughs> that was that was Tyler. That's just me. That's my account. <laughs> Shaggy, who says it wasn't me, it was Tom Riddle. Gryffindor's <laughs> lost diadem. Hmm, I wonder what the answer could be, Eric. Ford built tough. Dumbledore sock knitter. Grubbly plank crookshank. Lockhart mockhart. Amy the old boot. Spider, 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 spiders, vroom, vroom, vroom. <laughs> and let's see who else. Laura plus Debbie equals lobby. I don't know okay. what that means. <laughs> okay. We have a lot of creative listeners. Wow. We do. Yeah. Well done with these names. Oh, wait. They resubmitted Laura plus Dobby equals Lobby. Does that okay. make you feel better, Lobby? <laughs> I'm glad they resubmitted. Yeah, that, <laughs> that makes more sense. All right. Justice for Dobby, y'all. Next week's quiz is question. Hopefully a little bit harder than the last one. What does Fred drop on George's head after he learns that Percy has a girlfriend? So submit your answers at MuggleCast.com slash Quizage. There's much more MuggleCast waiting for everybody on our Patreon. Patreon.com slash MuggleCast is where you can pledge today and receive instant access to bonus MuggleCast installments, our recording studio, our exclusive Facebook group and Discord group. And each year you can receive a physical gift like this year's wand or the MuggleCast Collectors Club. And Apple Podcast users can subscribe to the show right through there for $2.99 a month, and you will receive ad-free MuggleCast and early access to each new episode of the show, just like patrons do. No matter how you support us, we really appreciate it, so thank you, everybody. And also, make sure you're following the show for free in your favorite podcast app, and leave us a five-star review if they allow you to and you like the show. And don't forget that we are MuggleCast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. So those are all our plugs. Tyler? Thanks so much for joining us today. Great having you on. Uh, where should people follow you? Uh, you can follow me pretty much everywhere, just at Tyler Starr, T-Y-L-O-R-S-C-A-R-R. And of course, the unofficial Harry Potter vegan cookbook is in stores all over the country. Uh, support your local bookstore. Go get it. Uh, I like to get mine from Barnes & Noble. So yeah, that's where you can pick it up. Barnes & Noble is cool again. People didn't like them for a time, but they're like cool again because they're oh, like yeah. the last bookstore standing across America. But I know a another great place to support indie bookstores is bookshop.org. I'm sure we can find the cookbook on there. Definitely. When you 
purchase through bookshop.org, they distribute funds to local bookstores, which is really great. So Mm -hmm. Tyler, thanks again for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Listeners, uh, check out our show notes. We'll have links to where you can find Tyler there. And that does it for this week's episode of MuggleCast. We'll be back with the final chapter of Chamber of Secrets and episode 599 next week. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Micah. I'm Laura. And I'm Tyler. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all. See ya.